I've got to start with a nice, uh, an ambitious topic for the first thing in the morning. Uh, hi, hi, I'm Andrew. And although I'm going to talk about science and philosophy later, I'm going to start the talk, I think, by just giving you a bit of an idea of the way that I think about it. Because I want to change the way that we see this process. I think a lot of us just see aging as a natural part of being alive. But actually, in my book and in this talk, I'm going to characterise it as our greatest humanitarian challenge. And that might sound like a slightly weird thing to call this natural process, but I'm going to try and bring you along with me. I think a lot of us also think that ageing is an inevitable thing, something that we you know, happens to us, happens to our friends, our family, even our pets and farm animals age. You know, actually, the latest breakthroughs in biology are showing us that we can slow down, we can even reverse this process in the lab, and we're just starting to make our way to doing that with human animal trials. And it's actually this combination that makes this so exciting. Because on the one hand, we've got this incredible, um, you know, seemingly inevitable process, this world's largest humanitarian challenge. And on the other, we've got the science to rise to that challenge. And I think that means we're on the cusp of the greatest revolution in medicine since the discovery of antibiotics. So I'll explain a bit about why I'm in the talk. Um, I also will get on to why I think we should really be talking about curing aging. That might sound like a slightly strange thing. I'm not one of those people who likes to call aging a disease. But nonetheless, I think we should be thinking about curing it. I'm going to tell you a bit about why later on. Well, I'm actually going to start with, um, with a graph. And it's a graph that has huge significance to me because I started out as a physicist and all the way to doing a PhD in physics before deciding that I wanted to work on aging. And I changed career because of this graph. In fact, it's because I was a physicist that I was able to change career because of the graph. But I'm going to start with it. It's going to be fast enough for me. Strange. Anyway, um, so this is a graph, very, very simple. We've got the age in years on the bottom. We've got the risk of death up the side. I think all of us know that older people are more likely to die. But just how much really shocked me. So let's go through you know, what these numbers mean. You start off, if you're lucky enough to be born in a rich country, you have about a half a percent risk of not making your first birthday. But the good news is things carry on improving after that. And uh, if we look at current 10-year-olds, they have an incredible title. They are the safest human beings in the history of our species. They have a less than 1 in 10,000 chance of not getting to their 11th birthday. But unfortunately, as you can see from this, it's all downhill, or I guess on this graph uphill from there. Um, I'm 38, and what that means is that I've got about a 1 in 1,000 chance of dying this year. Now, that's obviously a lot bigger than 1 in 10,000, but actually, it's worth thinking about that just for a moment. I quite like those odds. Because what that means is if that were to extend out for the rest of my life, which of course it won't, but I'd live into my 1,030s on average. So human beings really do have this incredible ability to keep their bodies in this almost perfect state of stability. Homeostasis is the biological word that allows us to be an incredibly low risk of death for really quite a long period. But unfortunately, humans have something called a mortality rate doubling time. It's the amount of time it takes for your risk of death to double. And that's about eight years if you're a person. And as we carry on going through life, once you get to 65, risk of death is about 1% that year. That's still not too bad. You live into your 160s on average were that to continue. But unfortunately, 1% is now a big enough number that doubling it is starting to become important. Um, if you live to 80, you've got about a 5% chance of dying that year. And if I'm fortunate enough to live into my 90s, but unfortunate enough that none of the ideas that we're going to be talking about this week come to anything, I'll be somewhere aware of the top of this graph. A risk of death every year of more than one in six. So that's life and death at the roll of the dice. And there are two ways of looking at this graph. You can either look at it as a human being and think, wow, that's terrifying. I've got this exponential wall of mortality coming towards me every day of my life. Or you can look at it, as naively as a physicist, and think, this is fascinating. But what is this incredibly synchronized process that happens in all of our bodies, in everybody all around the world throughout history? If I was to pluck someone from the Amazon rainforest, someone from the 16th century, one of you from this audience, you wouldn't necessarily have much in common. You'd have very different life expectancies. But that mortality rate doubling time, that risk of, double, uh, risk of death doubling every eight years, would be constant. It seems to be a thing about being human, right? So what can we do? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is dispel a myth. And that myth is that you can die of old age. Because you might look at this and think, well, yeah, clearly it's the aging process that's killing you. Biologically speaking, that's true. But actually what kills you is, um, is the diseases that aging causes. So I've got a slightly different graph here. Still aging is on the bottom, but your chance of getting a given illness on the side. And uh, if you look at some common age-related diseases, we've got cancer, heart disease, stroke, dementia. You can see that all of these things follow a very similar pattern to the risk of death. In fact, dementia is almost unheard of before the age of 60, unless you've got a particular genetic variant that exposes you. And it doubles in risk every four and a half years after that. So it's a very strongly age-related disease. It's not just, by the way, these so-called non-communicable diseases that your body essentially does to itself. Um, this disgusting green mucusy line here is chest infections. Now you can see that even as a young adult, you've got a, a 1 or 2 percent chance of getting one of these things. So this isn't just a cough or a sniffle, this isn't that gets right down into your lungs. But if you do get one of these diseases, um, if, you're, if you're younger, 
then you've got a less developed immune system, you're more, more likely to succumb. And as you get older, your weakening immune system, your aging immune system, gets more and more likely to succumb as well. And of course, the other thing is not just you're more likely to catch these things as you get older, you're also much more likely to die of them. So people who are older have uh, literally, uh, someone in their 80s is literally hundreds of times more likely to die of, say, COVID than someone who catches it in their 20s. And that's why public service announcement, anyone who's eligible who hasn't got their flu or COVID vaccine, please go and get it right now. And actually, I think it's probably worth it even for young people too, because you, know, you can see the, the risk of getting these infections is still you know, perilously high even at our young ages. Now, you might be thinking, Andrew, this is something that we in the rich world are perversely lucky enough to have. We're living long enough that we can expect to get these horrible diseases, right? So you know, I think it's something that's sort of unique to us. But what I thought I'd do is uh, talk to you a bit about global life expectancy. And to make it a bit more fun, I'm going to make this into a quiz. So I'd like everyone to stand up. And the way this quiz is going to work is I'm going to flash some numbers up on my slides. And if you think that, that number is greater than or equal to global life expectancy, I want you to sit down. So I'm going to give you a free starter, which is if I flash it 40 years and you're an extreme pessimist and you think global life expectancy is below 40 years, you can sit down now. Very good, no extreme pessimists. So, any takers for 50 years? It's 85. Anyone for 60 years? Anyone for 65 years? Global life expectancy. This is all the countries around the world, of course, average. Anyone for 70 years? Got a few options standing up, including the guy who's got a book coming out on life uh, <laughs> expectancy statistics. 75 years. We've got one. Oh, right. Die hard. Sit at the back. <laughs> The answer actually, almost all of you got it wrong, I'm sorry to say. This was the global life expectancy back in 2019. Um, the reason I've chosen 2019 is that was a little pandemic in the intervening time, of course this is a bit wild. This is, you know, where things were back at that time when things were relatively stable. Now there are a couple of different ways to look at this. The first is that this is an incredible achievement. I think this is the greatest achievement in the history of our species is that most people in most countries can expect to live in an older age. But on the other side of this, if we go back to this graph, I can say I changed my career, so I'm going to keep revisiting it. Um, you can see that people in most countries are now living long enough to get a decent way up this curve. They're getting a decent way into those diseases of ageing. And as such, ageing isn't just a problem that we're experiencing in the rich world, it's one that applies to everybody globally. And in fact, if you run the numbers, every single day, about 150,000 people die. So every one of these little uh, stick figures here is a thousand deaths. More than two thirds of those deaths, so more than a hundred thousand people, die essentially because of aging. They die of the cancer, the dementia, the increased risk of infectious disease, and so on. And this is why I characterise aging as our greatest humanitarian challenge. It's easily our largest cause of death. You can get all the other causes of death, add them together, double them, and you still don't get to what aging matches. And also, all the ways that you die of aging, the cancer, the heart disease, the, you know, even an infectious disease caught in old age, there's a huge amount of suffering that comes before that. Then there's the frailty, the incontinence, the loss of eyesight, hearing, all these things we wouldn't necessarily call diseases, they slowly drag you down as well. And that's why I think it's arguably our largest cause of suffering as well as our largest cause of death. So, this might be a very depressing talk, it might be a very depressing book, but we're going to go back to this graph one more time, I'm going to show you what I think is the optimistic future that we should be aiming for. So once again, this is our risk of death, uh, doubling every eight years, but this is not a universal fact of biology, it's not a law that we must age. And a creature that's uh, quite inspiring in this regard is this beautiful little thing, it's called a hydra. It's about a centimetre long, it's found uh, in fresh water. And hydra first came to the attention of the scientific community as a very incredible regenerative powers. So if you cut a hydra in half, you get two hydra, the tail grows a head, the head grows a tail. In fact, scientists have even put a hydra in a blender and made it into loads and loads and loads, loads of little pieces, and then you get loads and loads and loads and loads, and loads, and loads of that adult hydra come out the other side. But the other really cool thing about hydra is the scientists noticed, as they were studying them in the lab, that their risk of death looks more like this. Uh, it's about 1.2% per year, and oh, we obviously haven't had time to actually do this experiment all the way through, but we think about 10% of the hydra would still be alive after a thousand years. Now what's exciting about this isn't how long the hydra lived, but that is kind of cool. What's really interesting is the fact that their risk of death doesn't change depending on how long ago they were born. This is a phenomenon called negligible senescence, it's sometimes uh, referred to slightly more glitzily as biological immortality. And this is what I mean when I talk about a cure for ageing. I'm not talking about living forever, I'm not talking about some sci-fi immortality, you know, uploading your mind into a machine. The idea is we could have a risk of death that, like the Hydra, doesn't vary depending on how long ago we were born. Talking about a cure doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen soon, but it does mean that this is, I think, where we should be aiming for. We should be trying to flatten this curve as much as possible and get humans as close as possible to negligible senescence to push back, to delay all of those different diseases and frailties and things that affect us as we get older. 
Now you might be thinking, Andrew, this is all very well, but that's a centimeter long plant creature with a few hundred cells. How does that compare to me in my 57 trillion cell glory? Well, actually, there are some animals that are negligibly senescent. They're a bit closer to us evolutionarily. Uh, this beautiful beast is a Galapagos tortoise. The eldest recorded one made to 177. We think she was brought back from the Galapagos Islands by Charles Darwin, but survived him by more than a century. And again, these animals don't just live a very long time. In fact, you might not be the greatest ambassadors for healthy aging because they're relatively pretty slow moving throughout their lives. But these animals are basically as sprightly at 150 as they were at 50. Um, Harriet actually died of a heart attack just 100 years later than a human would have done. She was basically healthy throughout her life up until that point. So these animals literally get older without getting old. Um, another animal even closer to us, this beautiful thing, you might be thinking, Andrew, that's a penis with teeth. It's actually an animal called a naked mole rat. Uh, they're about the same size as rats and mice, very closely related. Whereas rats or mice live two or three or four years in the lab, these things can make it into their 30s. And they're incredibly resistant to age-related diseases. Uh, they get very poor cognitive decline, they still be productively active right until the end of life. We actually thought they were completely cancer-proof until scientists started studying them in big enough colonies that we found a very occasional tumour. But, you know, even if not aesthetically, this is what we should be aspiring to. <laughs> so, how are we going to go about doing that? Well, when you ask most people what is ageing, and I've already alluded to a bit of this, a lot of people talk about the wrinkles, the grey hair, the cosmetic stuff, there's the diseases that doctors worry about, there's the things that aren't really age-related but are much worse if you're older, like if you break a bone and you're young, it's not a big deal, whereas if you break a bone and you're older, it can be the beginning of the end, essentially. And then there's all these different kinds of loss, essentially the frailty, the loss of independence, but the cool thing is now, if you ask an, uh, an aging scientist what is aging, um, they might give you an answer that looks a little bit more like this. These are the hallmarks of aging. We've already had those mentioned this morning. I've got 10. Everyone's got a different number. We all like to have a bit of a scientific bun fight over it, but basically we're all talking about the same thing. And you'll be really to hear, I'm not going to go through every single one of these today. You have to read all of them right now. Um, but the, the, the idea of these is that they are the fundamental cellular, molecular underpinnings of what it means to be on a biological level. As these changes happen, they cause a whole range of age-related problems. And to give you a bit more of a concrete example of what that might actually mean, I think the best one to go with is probably this number five, the accumulation of what are called senescent cells. Now these are aged cells that accumulate in our bodies as we get older, and they seem to be responsible for a whole range of age-related problems. And the reason that we can tell that is because we've developed drugs called senolytic drugs that we can give to mice, and we can essentially make them biologically younger. So there was a really cool paper that came out in 2018, where scientists gave a combination of drug, drugs called satin and quercetin to some mice. They were aged about 24 months, which is sort of 50, 60 years old in human terms, because obviously mice have a much shorter lifespan. And what they found was, well, firstly, the mice lived longer, which I guess is a good thing, but they didn't just drag out the period of frailty at the end of life. The mice got healthier as well. So they get less cancer, they get less heart disease, they get fewer cataracts. They're less frail, these little mice, so you can uh, put them on a tiny mouse-sized treadmill, and you can see how far they can run, and the mice that have had the drugs can run further and faster on the treadmill. Um, they get less cognitive issues, so you can put a mouse in a maze, an old mouse is often a bit anxious, doesn't really want to explore the environment, where a young mouse might be much more willing to go and find the cheese or whatever it is these scientists do with their mice. Um, and what they found was that by giving them these senolytic drugs, you clear out the senescent cells, you restore some of that youthful curiosity. And finally, the mice just look great. Um, I thought I'd show you a picture of this from the illustrious scientific journal, The Daily Mail. And what you can see is that these mice, you do not have to be an expert mouse biologist to tell which one has had the drugs. Uh, the one that's had the senolytic drugs, they're both the same age, has better fur, it's got thicker skin, it's got less grey hair. Um, so it even has an effect on the cosmetic aspects of ageing. And what this really shows us is that by intervening in the hallmarks, by intervening in these fundamental underlying causes of ageing, you can have an impact across the whole of the ageing process. You can affect many, perhaps even all of the diseases of ageing, and the wrinkles, the grey hair, the frailty, all of this different stuff at the same time. So this really is the dream for anti-aging medicine. If you can get these things into humans, now 20 or 30 companies already trying human trials on these drugs, then we can hopefully slow down aging across the board and have this huge effect on quality of life and health and, and so on. So, the problem is, we've got all these other hallmarks of aging, and senescent cells have got you know, a reasonable amount of funding and attention, uh, there's also, you might have heard of a company called Altos Labs that are looking at epigenetic alterations. But actually, quite a lot of these, also the, the cellular reprogramming, so that's more commonly called. But actually, quite a lot of the other hallmarks, and the more basic science of how these hallmarks all connect to one another, is substantially underinvested in. And I think the best way to show you an example of that is to look at the cost of chronic diseases to the United States. 
Um, these numbers are actually a couple of years out of date, so they've only grown in the intervening time as the population has continued to age. And what you can see is that my favourite, I guess is the wrong word, uh, age-related diseases are costing hundreds of billions of dollars, a total of almost a trillion dollars there, and that's just four of the things that go wrong with you as you get older. And that's um, the cost not just of the healthcare, but the wider cost of society, so the fact that people are, you know, have to leave the economy because they get unwell, because they might give up work to look after an elderly relative and so on. And let's compare that to the amount of money that is invested in the National Institute on Aging. That's the US government body that is responsible for uh, funding basic science into aging biology. It's about three and a half billion, and that little square is obviously proportional to the size of the amount of money that we spend, so you can see it's already very small. And actually, there's a running joke in aging biology. The NIA doesn't stand for National Institute on Aging, but National Institute on Alzheimer's Disease. And the reason is that if you break down the budget, about two thirds of it goes to the Neuroscience Division, which is essentially studying dementia. Um, the other things the NIA do get to about another billion. And that means the actual aging biology division, the bit that's doing the stuff that I really care about, gets about $350 million per year. That's a bit more than $1 per American for something that kills 85% of Americans. So there's just this absolutely dramatic mismatch between the amount we invest in the basic science. And even if you're going to be completely you know, economically focused, there's a huge incentive to make this number bigger, to try and make these numbers smaller before you even care about quality of life and health and happiness and you know, grandparents meeting their grandkids and so on. So I really think this is the most powerful argument as to why we need to talk about this stuff. So um, the other problem is that in the UK, we don't have a National Institute for Aging. In fact, we don't have any real way of keeping any kind of tabs on how much money we invest. There aren't really many uh, strands of research council funding that are trying to incentivize scientists to work on aging. One of the big problems is that you run a program like the Lifelong Health and Wellbeing, which I think MRC and BBSRC might have done together about 10 years ago, and you get a lot of people working on age-related diseases like cancer scientists then um, saying, well, what I do with aging, essentially, it's about lifelong like, health and well-being, because I'm working on one of these diseases that happen at the end of life. This is hugely important work, but it's not as important, I don't think, as the aging uh, biology that underpins the reason we get unwell in the first place. So I think, from a policy point of view, we really need to start directing more funding specifically, with strings attached, to make sure that it goes towards the aging biology that is really going to move the needle against some of the biggest social challenges that we've got facing us. Um, so the first thing I've already said is we need more basic science, but I think the other thing we need, therefore, is more advocacy. Because I think that most people have never heard of the idea of treating aging, let alone curing it. And that includes not just you know, your average person on the street, this includes politicians and policymakers, the people who are deciding about how much science money there is given to various places. It includes scientists and doctors. I worked for five years as a biologist, and I found that even though I stopped studying biology at 16, I was often the smartest person in the room about aging biology. It's not because I'm some kind of genius, it's because none of the biologists have ever had a lecture on it. It doesn't have a page in their textbooks. Uh, I met my wife during this time, she's a doctor. She thought I was crazy when I talked about the idea of treating aging medically. She'd never had a lecture on it, even though during her career, she's almost certain to have to prescribe the kinds of drugs that this science is going to produce. Which is absolutely crazy, as you can see. Thankfully, I am a, <laughs> I'm persuasive. But nonetheless, this is really a fight we need to take to loads and loads of different places, because the potential of this medicine is just so, so huge. Um, I think the other thing is that it will be an absolute industrial policy coup for a country to start trying to do some of this stuff. Because this is going to be the biggest industry, perhaps ever, because when you develop a cancer drug, it can apply to one subset of patients with a particular kind of cancer that that drug targets. If you develop a drug or a supplement for aging, literally every living human is aging, and so that market is just so, so much larger. And so, you know, if the UK can become a hub for this kind of stuff, you can get out ahead, you can have the experts, you can have the industry setting itself up here because it's near the labs that are doing the good work, then it's going to be a huge, huge industry to be on the forefront of. And that's why um, I think the single best piece of health advice, you don't have to go as far as Brian Johnson, long before you get to that point, the single best piece of health advice is to spread the word about aging biology. Because the more people know about this stuff, the longer and healthier not just you're going to live, but everyone you love, all your friends, your family you care about, um, all the millions of people around the world you don't know, they're all going to live longer because of the progress in this basic science. So ultimately, that's why I ended up writing a book. I actually don't really need to plug the book today, because I believe you've got a copy in your bags, which is very nice. Um, you can find out more if you want to send a friend to buy a copy. Ah, you just start link. There's also something that isn't in your bag, which is a free bonus chapter on the ethics of treating aging medicines. You can find it at link slash ethics. Um, because this is a potentially policy nerdy audience, you can also see a report that I submitted to the House of, Lo uh, House of Lords Science and Technology Select Committee on aging biology a few years ago, giving the policy suggestions that I think the UK should take up to put the science forward. I'm also on all the social media. You can get to steal that link and follow me on things. Thank you very much. Thank you.